Okay, in this video, I'm going to discuss the constructivist theory and also Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. And in this video, the objectives here will be that we will construct a definition of what constructivism is. Also, we'll compare and contrast what happens in a constructivist classroom and a traditional classroom. Also, there will be a video where you'll evaluate a classroom that's using Vygotsky's approach to constructivism. But pretty much we'll talk about what his uh, approach to constructivism is. We'll start this video with a question. Do you teach or do you educate? Now, embedded in the PowerPoint slide, there is a video where you'll be uh, given a definition of what the word teach is and what the word educate is. And as you watch this video, I'm going to uh, have you ask yourself, which definition do you fit in a particular situation? So uh, you may pause the video and go to the PowerPoint slide and uh, watch the video on uh, do you teach or do you educate? Okay. All right. Now, to, to begin this video again, we'll uh, have you watch another video on the absent professor. In this link, there is a uh, typical classroom, and I would like for you to watch that video on the absent professor and explain to yourself what do you see happening with the teacher and the students in that classroom. Okay, now that you have seen what uh, typically happens in what in our traditional classroom, now we can go ahead and begin our discussion of what constructivism is and what you should have in a construct in a classroom using the concept of constructivism. Here, constructivism is a theory about how people learn. It says that people construct their own understanding and knowledge of the world, and here. Learning is a social advancement that involves language, real-world situations, and interaction and collaboration. That's going to be very important in a constructivist classroom because there has to be some type of communication or some type of language used. Real-world situations, things that are related to real life, that has to be in a constructivist classroom. Also, there has to be interaction among students as well, and also collaboration. Pretty much, you have to have peer collaboration in order for this, for you to have a successful classroom. And also, the learners are central in the learning process. Usually in a traditional classroom, the teacher is pretty much the center of the classroom. In this case, it's the other way around, the learners are the central portion of that uh, learning process. And pretty much the history of constructivism starts off with this particular uh, psychologist named Jean, Jean Piaget. Piaget was best known for his research on children's cognitive development, where humans learn through the construction of one logical structure after another, and also implications and applications shape the foundation of constructivist education. So here, this is where the uh, constructivist theory start off with. And then John Dewey said this, that education was to be grounded in real experience. So here you have to have real life experiences in order for education to be grounded, and then inquiry, inquiry is the key part of constructivist learning. And then another founding father of the constructivist theory was Jerome Bruner. His belief was that learners construct new ideas and or concepts based upon existing knowledge. 
Okay. So pretty much you have to have existing knowledge in order for new concepts to be constructed. And then theories emphasize the significance of cate categorization in learning. Now, the person that I'm going to be talking about specifically is uh, Mr. Lev Vygotsky. He's the one that uh, introduced the social aspect of learning into constructivism. He came up with the uh, social uh, cultural theory. And this is a place where communication is the very important piece in this uh, in uh, constructivism. Okay. Now he replaces more emphasis on cultural affecting shaping on cultural affecting shaping cognitive development and then more emphasis is placed on social factors contributing to cognitive development and on the role of the language in cognitive development. Now he's the individual that uh, created what we call the zone of proximal development, which is uh, part of what I will be talking about later in this video. Okay, so Vygotsky will be the individual that I'll be focusing on in this particular video. All right, now, what would be in a traditional classroom and a constructivist classroom? All right. Here I'm going to ask you to pause the video again and then watch this video called Constructivist versus Traditional Classroom. That video is embedded in the PowerPoint uh, presentation. So you can just click on that and then spend a few minutes and watch that video and find out the difference between what's in a constructivist classroom and what's in a traditional classroom. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is give you some of the characteristics that you typically see in a traditional classroom, and then we'll look at some of the characteristics that are in a constructivist classroom. All right, now, on your handout, you should see the difference between what's in a traditional classroom and a constructivist classroom. Now, in the traditional classroom, usually the lessons start off with components of a particular concept presented first. And then in a traditional classroom, you also see the teacher instruction, where the teacher is just teaching the class, and there's not much dialogue between that teacher and the student. And then students are working individually versus the groups. And then more value is placed on testing or results versus a process or the application of knowledge. Usually the traditional classroom, usually you'll find that uh, teachers are teaching, or quote, teaching to the test. They're focusing on material that they will find on a standardized test other than trying to find out, other than teaching the process or the application of the knowledge, how that knowledge can be applicable to real life. And also, learning is best assessed, assessed based upon scores and exams. Okay, so usually the teacher will uh, grade exams, and if they see that their test scores, if the student's test scores are low, that means that uh, the student hasn't learned the material. However, in a constructivist classroom, it's a little bit different. Here, you have active dialogue between students and the teacher. That's going to be very important because in this constructivist classroom, there has to be what we call active learning or active dialogue. Also, group interaction is encouraged to foster negotiation among students. So here, you have to have groups, students in groups, in, have the members in the groups interact, interact with one another and uh, process the material. The value is placed on the process of learning through experience and interaction. And also, the construction of knowledge is based upon a comprehensive view of learning. Okay, so those are the differences in a construction, 
constructivist classroom and a con and a uh, traditional classroom. Now, who can benefit? What are some of the benefits of a constructivist classroom? Here, children learn more when they're actively involved, which is very important because they have to be actively involved, otherwise they'll be bored in the classroom. Constructivism concentrates on knowledge, on learning, how to think and understand. Students can create organizing principles that they can take with them to other learning settings. Also, constructivism gives students ownership of what they learn. And then students will learn to ask questions learn to question things and to apply their natural curiosity to the world and constructivism promote, promote social and communication skills by creating a classroom environment that emphasizes <clears throat> collaboration and exchange of ideas. So usually um, group discussions are going to be very important here in a classroom. <coughs> Now, some of the criticisms is that the use of the model can be time-consuming, it can be inefficient, it can be ex expensive, it requires a mix of other theories, and there is no one clear theory that can be used. One, it can be too subjective. Learner must have a high, higher level of self-management or maturity for success. Usually, in groups, you want to group people that have very a variety of uh, learning capabilities here in order for it to be successful. The outcomes can be unpredictable, and then it's difficult to, to develop authentic tasks. And finally, it encourages diversity of thought where conformity is required. Okay. So those are the benefits and some of the... Uh, criticisms in, a, in the use of a constructivist classroom. Okay, now the zone of proximal development, or abbreviated ZPD. That's going to be the distance between the actual development level as determined by independent problem solving and the level of potential development as determined through problem solving under the adult under the adult guidance or collaboration of more capable peers. Okay, and this is an illustration of what the zone of proximal, proximal development is. The level of actual development is down here, what the student can do on his own independently. And then this zone right here of proximal development, that's going to be what the student can do with assistance. That's going to be the level of potential development. And then up here at the top is what the student can't do, even if there was assistance. And usually you have a capable peer or an adult guidance, usually a teacher or an instructor in that classroom. For example, let's say if a student wanted to, uh, if I was teaching a uh, class on uh, matrices, solving a system of equations using uh, matrices, and the student was not able to do that. However, let's say this student can uh, do uh, find the, de find the uh, determinant of a two-by-two two matrix. That's something that the student can do. Then, with my assistance, or with a capable peer, Usually we teach a uh, class with a uh, supplemental uh, assistance class where there is a capable peer, which is a facilitator. That facilitator can help that student with that particular concept with, that's going to be within that zone of proximal development because if the student can, is capable of uh, finding a determinant of a 2x2 two two matrix, then he can, that facilitator can help that student uh, set up the uh, approach of uh, coming up with those uh, three different uh, division, four matrices to uh, 
come up with the ordered pairs for that system of equations. Okay, so that would be something that the student can do with the assistance of a uh, facilitator or the instructor. Okay, I do have another video for you to watch, so you can pause this video and uh, click on the link for Zone of Proximal Development. You'll find a real life example and also a classroom example of a uh, Zone of Proximal Development that is applied. Okay, now let's talk about some of the methods that are used in the classroom where the zone of proximal development can be applied. Okay, now there are six different uh, methods that are given here. One of them is whole group instruction. In this case, the teacher introduces a topic or a unit with models of what is to be expected. The students will share their work and thinking processes and then the teachers and the students conclude a topic or a unit by sharing thoughts and reflections. And some of the benefits for that would be that the mutual objectives can be established by the teachers and the students up front. Opportunities for the development of listening skills increase. And then different ways of approaching a problem are encouraged and explored. And then the second method is small group instruction, where the teacher presents specific content most appropriate for each group of students and then the teachers and the students use manipulatives to solve problems and communicate ideas and then teacher assesses student understanding in greater depth. The benefits of small group instruction would be that the teaching and learning are focused on a more individualized level. Uh, active student engagement in learning increases and then opportunities for to identify and work in students ZPDs or Zone of Proximal Development emerge as activities are tailored for each group, each group based on student performance. Third method would be small group play or games. Here the students interact with, teach, and learn from peers and then the teachers allow time for students to explore, discover, and create with materials provided to them. Some of the benefits would be that there are opportunities for the development of social skills that increases. Students, students' feelings of autonomy increases and then students' creativity, imagination, and other strengths can be tapped. The fourth one will be the fourth formal individual assessments. That's where the teachers gain instructionally valuable information about students' independent thinking and not just for the purpose of, a, of obtaining a number or a grade. Some of the benefits would be that opportunities to identify students' actual level of development emerge, opportunities to identify students' strengths and weaknesses arise, and opportunities for teachers to work one-on-one -on -one with students. The fifth is the computer-based assessment tutorials. Here, teachers expose students, students to the same content in a different, op, often very engaging context. Teachers gather data on students' progress and or proficiency. Software includes scaffolding supports the teacher's efforts to teach within each student's zone of proximal development and helps her do this efficiently on a larger scale. Some of the benefits would be that opportunities for students to be exposed to the same material in another context and from a different perspective arise. Opportunities for students to be more actively engaged in learning through the, tech, through the use of technology emerge. Opportunities for students to individualize assessment and instruction based on every student's unique ZPD emerge without sacrificing valuable instruction time. And then the last would be the informal individual assessments. In this case, the teachers confirm whether or not the planned learning took place using, few, using a few simple questions at the end of a lesson. 
and then the benefits will be it gives the opportunities for teachers to immediately identify and clarify misunderstandings that arise opportunities to differentiate instruction emerge based on students level of understanding following the initial lesson Now here we have some common practices for using the uh, zone of proximal development that I would like to uh, discuss here. Okay, among highly, perfect, highly effective teachers, common practices includes tools and activities that have these five attributes. Number one, it includes clear goals and objectives. Number two, it uses available space and appropriate resources. It also involves movement around the classroom. So here, this is where the active engagement or the active, well, having them actively engaged in the learning, having them move around. Include a range of individual small group and whole group instruction. And then finally, it promotes and encourages inquiries and discussions. So pretty much these common practices are pretty much uh, typically what you will have to use in a uh, classroom where the zone of proximal development is encouraged and also the uh, constructivist theory. Now to close out this video that I have here, I want you to think about these two questions here and uh, ask yourself, how would you, as an educator, construct a classroom of adult, adult learners using the constructivist model? And then second, how would you, as an educator, help an adult learner succeed in the classroom using Vygotsky's zone of proximal development? Okay, so as I close out this video, just think about those two questions uh, because pretty much whether you're a classroom instructor like I am or whether you're teaching um, in the secondary school or in a community college or a four-year institution, this idea can be used at all levels. Okay. I'd like to thank you all for uh, listening to this video on uh, constructivism and uh, the zone of proximal development by Vygotsky. By